Father, we ask you that the words that are spoken throughout this time that we have together would really be penetrating. God, we become more than listeners. We become doers. Lord, we believe that our nation is entering a time and has been in this time for some period where decisions that are being made are setting the course for the rest of our lives and for this nation. God, we want to be part of the solution for what you're offering and what you're doing. Can you say amen to that? Lord, we're here because we want to become part of the solution. And Lord, I do know that there's question marks and questions that people are asking. Where do we go from here and what do we do? I pray, God, that you would anoint the speakers, anoint the worship leaders, so that when we leave here, we will have ascertained what your mind is and what your direction is for all of our lives. Can you say amen to that? Lord, again, we want to be answers to the questions that the world and the church is asking right now. And God, we ask that there be an impartation in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to tell you about the origins of this message. A couple of weeks ago, I had been seeking the Lord for 2024. I knew that this conference had a title to it called Preparing for War in 2024. And what I was doing was laying our schedule, our plans for 2024 before the Lord. Each year, Morningstar projects six to 12 months in advance. And part of my responsibility here at Morningstar as uh, one of the leaders of Morningstar's Fellowship of Ministries and as a vice president, is to set some spiritual agenda and offer those to our to Chris and to the leadership team. And to be honest with you, we were a bit ambitious with some of the plans that we had, and we were planning a couple international conferences. These international conferences, one which is going to be taking place in April of this coming year, was of a particular area of prayer before God. And again, to be transparent with you, I was really hoping for some level of affirmation from the Lord about whether we should push ahead to do this because of the complexities of it. And I I, I think that you would... uh, most of you would have this experience where you're asking God for some sort of information while you still are questioning the direction that you're taking. Has anybody felt like that? Okay. And so a couple of weeks ago, after probably two or three weeks of prayer and fasting, not consistent fasting, but consistent prayer, I was awakened in the morning, and as I'm waking up, I have this experience. And I'm hearing something that is a cry. And this cry is for help. And so it's quite profound and quite poignant in my mind that this cry is coming from Europe, which to me was some affirmation that the plans that we were making for this conference in Germany, it was the Lord. And so um, periodically, perhaps you've experienced something like this, where you hear a voice And although it's not necessarily something that you hear in your ear, you hear it in your spirit. And I could hear 
that we were in a place and the people that were crying out for assistance were individuals that were resisting the rising spirit of the Antichrist. And these were believers, sincere, dedicated believers that were resisting this rising tide. And I was also connecting some things that have happened to me in the past to this this moment in time and it had to do with the D-Day invasion. Now let me try and weave all this together. We know in the 1930s and early 40s that there was also an emergence of the spirit of Antichrist. And this manifested itself in Germany and it also manifested itself in an attack against the Jews. And so with this rising spirit of the Antichrist that I was feeling and sensing as I'm awakening in this morning, there's also an attack against the nation of Israel and against the Jewish people. And we've seen demonstrations in our nation and responses in our nation that are quite disturbing, as a matter of fact, revolting in many instances. But this spirit is manifesting itself and God wants to do something about it. If I could say, if I could summarize what I'm gonna talk to you as I present this, I do believe that this is a call to action. This is a call to the believers that there is a call of God on our lives to resist the mounting forces of this antichristal spirit that is manifesting itself not only in Europe, but throughout the nations of the earth. And what God was likening this to me was this call for a D-Day-like invasion. And let me give you a little bit of background before I go into some details. In 1999, which is quite a long time ago, I felt the Lord speak to me. And this is long before I came to Morningstar, about five years before I came to Morningstar, but I certainly knew Rick and had, uh, had interaction with him as part of the Fellowship of Ministries and Fellowship of Churches. And in 1999, the Lord spoke to me, and he told me I would be part of a D-Day-like invasion that would manifest itself in different nations, and more specifically, in the European nations. And I began to study D-Day, and I felt like I was to release something. And the reason I'm going into this background is to give some weight of what I do believe God is not only calling me to and calling Morningstar to, but I believe he's calling us to. And so I, what I'd like to do in this message is draw some prophetic parallels. But before I do, I want to give you some unfolding prophetic things that God has spoken to me and then other unfolding prophetic confirmations for why I'm speaking on this. So in 1999, I do believe, and preachers will tell you this, is that there's a whole variety of weights or burdens that we feel, some which may be on a on one to 10 scale, a seven or an eight, but there's other prophetic words that we have, the weight of which is very profound. And I would say that what I'm gonna share with you is like a 10 for me. It's like one of the weightiest messages, and if I could say it like this, it has been a life message that has been confirmed over and over again with circumstances that I have been 
unable to control. And so the night as I'm getting ready on a Sunday morning to deliver this, and it's actually February 8th, or February 28th, 1999, as I'm going to bed to prepare and get ready for tomorrow, I felt like I was supposed to pick up the handset for my telephone, which I did. At three o'clock in the morning, my mother, who lives alone, called me and told me that she had fallen and I needed to take her to the hospital. And she had broken her arm quite severely and I was with her in the hospital until 10 o'clock in the morning and our services started at 10.30. And to me, it was a further confirmation that there was resistance to what I was about ready to deliver. And so I delivered this message actually in a series of messages called the D-Day Invasion. And again, I do believe that this is a call to action. One of the things I want to say is that there was prior to this war and our morning and United States involvement in this war in World War II, there was a tremendous amount of resistance in our nation And it was manifested through people like Charles Lindbergh, who was an isolationist, and other voices that didn't want us involved. But December 7th, 1941, changed everything. And you know that that's the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor And our military at that time was 175,000 troops. But everything was about to change. And what I want to say about this point concerning the mobilization of of our army, I do believe that God wants to mobilize Christians for an invasion that will happen all over the nations of the earth. December 8th, things were different than they were December 6th. And all of a sudden, individuals who were somewhat isolated or passive or did not have a sense of us responding to the growing spirit that and that the spirit of the Antichrist that was behind all of this, all of a sudden, things would change. We would go on in the next few years, and the amount of individuals that would be trained for war would be about 16 million troops that would be trained for battle. I hope you can feel some of the weight of the Spirit of God on those words. Is that there has been somewhat of a level of indifference that has infiltrated the church and somewhat of a passive mentality. If I just leave the devil alone, maybe he'll leave me alone. This spirit or this Philosophy or this approach was failing all over Europe. And there are people like Neville Chamberlain who, in, who uh, insisted on a doctrine of pacifism and also appeasement. And I will tell you this, if we can draw any parallel concerning this is If you just leave the devil alone, he's not going to leave you alone. What Winston Churchill said about the doctrine of appeasement, he said it's like feeding the alligator and hoping he eats you last. And so there is a call to action and response for the people of God in the hour in which we live in And eventually, some of the things that are at the doorsteps in other nations can and probably will come home 
to your front door. And I do believe that God is asking us to mobilize, to set us on a course that will not only resist, but overcome the forces of darkness and this antichrist spirit that is building all throughout the nations of the earth. Can I get an amen to that? So our troops would go from December 6th of 175,000 in the next 18 months to three years, there would be about 7.2 million people that would be inducted into the military or volunteer in the military. Of the eight of the 16 million people that America trained for their armed forces, 8.2 million of those were volunteers. Isn't that an impressive statistic? It says of of God that in, in, in the day of the Lord, people will volunteer, volunteer, volunteer freely in the day of his power. And so I do believe that there needs to be a shift. And let me say this. I respect individuals that are slugging it out, doing what God wants you to do on a day-to-day basis, and endeavoring to keep your house in order. But there's something beyond us keeping our own individual house in order. And one of the things that is a principle in the scriptures is that when individuals were simply focused on building their own house, there was a lack of fulfillment, a lack of progress and a lack of prosperity. I want to illustrate the book of Haggai. These individuals that are back in the nation are individuals who had made a sacrifice and a step to be released from Babylon and go back and do the things of God. That happened anywhere from 538 B.C. to 535 B.C. And the book of Haggai is written around 520 B.C. And there's not progress on the house of God. And one of the things that Haggai is going to identify that was keeping the people from the fulfillment that God had for them is that they were focused not on the corporate vision of the hour, but on their personal vision for their own lives. And so the way Haggai states this is this. You drink and you're still thirsty. You eat and you're hungry. You make wages, but you put it in bags with holes in it. And Haggai is going to identify the reason for all this was, was because there was not an embracing of the corporate vision of the hour. Are you tracking with me here? There's something for me to want to succeed personally. I've just spent a lot of time with my own kids and my own grandchildren children and boy do I want them to prosper I want them to do well I want their lives and for people to view their lives to be to be saying more aren't these people blessed and I don't think there's anything specifically wrong for that or with that but there's something that God wants me and my wife to identify other than just the focus on our own little family. Are you tracking with me here? So there was this necessity and what happened 
in the book, and it's just a couple chapters, is there's a shift that goes on. And this shift that takes place is the people make a commitment to engage in the corporate vision of the hour to rebuild the house of God. And what happens is it causes their decisions cause something to happen in heaven that would change things. I, I want to tell you this. Some of the decisions that we make can cause heaven to take action not only on our behalf, but to restore the glory to the house that God is wanting us to build. The glory of the latter shall be greater than that of the former. And if you read the book, and it's pretty easy to do that, when God sees that the individuals are more focused on building his house than their own house, something profound happens. And the book concludes like this, is the seed yet in the barn? You guys haven't even gone out to plant yet, but from that day forward, from the ninth month of the 24th day of the month, I'm gonna bless you. And I, I, I want to say this just by way of provoking some thought. Sometimes individuals are feeling like God's not quite answering or blessing the way I would like. And I do believe that at this time of year, as we're projecting into a new year, in an honest evaluation of whether we're fully engaged with what God is asking of us, if we would recon reconsider some of these things, there could be a shift from heaven. I, I, I wanna say this, and I, I don't wanna provoke anybody, but I wanna maybe challenge some of our thinking. I do believe that one of the reasons why our nation is not prospering the way it should be prospering is if you look at the overall statistics of contributions that believers make to church endeavors. The highest percentage of tithers in our nation, in any denomination, is about 25%. And I do believe that if we will get and reorder some of our finances, God can reorder our own finances. And could you imagine the impact that would happen if believers all over this nation were considering God's house and their finances first? I'm messing with a lot of people here. What the ramifications of that would be regardless of who is the Secretary of the Treasury or who is the President of the United States. That's extra. I didn't necessarily intend to speak on that, but this pattern of being involved in the house of God and making the corporate vision of our hour the vision that God has for us, I do believe it's somewhat like this shift of mentality that took place from December 6th to December 8th. And we would go on, and as I've already given you this number, we would go on to train about 18 or 16 million people. And I, I will tell you the fascination that I have with all of these statistics. And the shift of what happened is very profound. And I do believe that God is endeavoring to awaken within our own spirit a level of involvement and dedication to what he is doing in this coming year. So if we're talking about preparing for war in 2024, part of what God is asking us to do is to reassess or reevaluate our involvement in the very thing that is important to heaven. This, I, I wanna give you an example of mobilization. It was the will of God to restore and rebuild the temple and it was the will of God to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. But it lays in waste after these individuals, 
I, I want to say this. What I'm endeavoring to do, and I, I hope you take it like this, I'm, I'm endeavoring to exhort us to step into this arena. I'm endeavoring to give us a picture of what a completed house will look like. A completed, as it will, this, the walls of Jerusalem. So for about 80 years, after the individuals that have sacrificed and decided to return from Babylon are back in the nation, Nehemiah's asked for a report. And the report comes back to him that the walls are still broken down and the gates are burned with fire. And he's grieved. Uh, at times I feel that our walls are broken down and our gates are burned with fire. And the, the, and the enemy has too easy, too easy of an access into the areas that God would have us to have defended. And so what Nehemiah is going to capture in a profound way is he's going to capture the message that God had to restore and rebuild that nation. You know this story. It's a powerful story. He asked for deliverance from his, or release from his job as the cupbearer, and the king approves it, provided he returns. And so he goes to Jerusalem, he assesses the situation, and then he's going to speak the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is, you see the trouble that we're in. Our walls are broken down. Our gates are burned with fire. And somehow, that particular word resonated into the lives of these people. And I do believe that what, one of the things that I believe we gathered here to this conference for is to hear the reverberating word of the Lord from heaven about the condition that we're in and how we proceed, how we prepare for war in 2024. And so Nehemiah is going to speak these words and it's going to reverberate and it's going to touch the spirit of these people. And they put their hands to rebuild and to restore. And in 52 days, they accomplished what was not accomplished in the previous 80 years. This is a call to action, folks. This is a call to involvement. This is a call to go forward. This is a call for us to step in to the corporate invitation that God is giving to his people in this hour. This is a call for the people of God to mobilize. God wants us with a, a, with a trowel in one hand for building and a sword in another. I, I will tell you, even as I stand here before you, I feel the inspiration and the weight of the word of God that I'm speaking on. And so things change. And you may be wondering some of the prophetic parallels that I'm going to talk about here in the few minutes that I have left. I will tell you, th this D-Day invasion was the most complex military event that ever took place in the history of man. I, y y there was great 
generals that were behind the scenes planning all this. It is it it it, it involved 175,000 troops from a whole array of different nations. It involved 500 5,333 ships. It involved 11,000 aircrafts. It was like moving, get this, it was like moving Green Bay, Wisconsin, Kenosha, Wisconsin, and Racine, Wisconsin. Every man, woman, and child in those cities, every vehicle from one side of Lake Michigan to the other side in one night. That's how complex this operation was. And I do believe that God is asking the people of God to be involved in this allied invasion of what he wants to see accomplished. And there's a shift I do believe that God wants us to make in terms of embracing what he's doing. And so you may ask how you can become more involved with this. And I will tell you, it's the passion of my life. But we have had so many different things that have happened that give us confirmation of the direction that we're going in. I talked about this word of the Lord that I got in 1999 on February 28th. But we would have preceding confirmations of this as part of my responsibility here at Morningstar was to connect, connect or conduct regional and national and international roundtables. When we went to Quebec City, just shortly after all of this began to unfold, and this was like, well, it's not shortly, a few years later, one of the words that would be released to us in this particular time, we happened to be doing a, a Canadian roundtable in Quebec City, and little did we know that the weekend that we were planning this roundtable when we got there, it was the celebration of the D-Day invasion when, when Churchill and the premier of, I believe his name was Williams, or the prime minister of Canada, and Roosevelt, it was that weekend where they planned the D-Day invasion. There were so many other things that would happen. One of, the, one of these prophetic confirmations that we had was the pastor of the the, the church that invited us, we would go into these round tables and the pastor of the church would say it like this. Last night I had a dream. And in this dream, Billy Graham came to me. Now this is the pastor and we're looking for themes to support what we're doing that will complement one of the things that God's doing nationally and internationally. And so the pastor comes into the meeting and he says this. He said, last night I had a dream and Billy Graham came to me. And when Billy Graham came to me, he asked me, he said to me rather, you need to find out who William Stephenson is. And I ask in the room, there are about 30 or 40 leaders in the room. Does anybody know who William Stephenson is? Nobody in the room knew. There may be a few in here that know who William Stephenson is. How many people in the room do not know who William Stephenson is? I would say about 80 to 90%. So the pastor has this dream. And um, Billy Graham's telling him, you need to find out who this guy is. So we did some research. And just prior to this, I walked into a conversation. And in this conversation, right before the round table starts, I'm hearing a conversation concerning the power grid in North America, Northeastern United States, and some of the power grid that happens in Canada. And they're talking about a place called Church Hill Falls. And so, it's interesting, the name Churchill catches my attention. 
It's interesting. And I get a text from my assistant who is uh, back here in the United States, and uh, he's telling me about the birth of his son. This is two minutes before the round table is going to start. And the text is this. I just walked out of a conversation concerning Churchill Falls, and the text says this. Winston has arrived. The headline in the newspaper in that area that day. Somebody brought the headline in. In the spirit of Churchill. And so we kind of felt like God was talking to us about Winston Churchill and some of the various representations that he had that were different than the Neville Chamberlain administration and that we needed to begin to go on offense and we needed to begin to exercise some of the aggressive nature in order for us to conform to what God was doing and we just happened to be there at the same time that they're celebrating a D-Day like invasion. There's so many parallels here but what a One of the things that I do believe that God is endeavoring to do is to mobilize his people for the challenges of the hour and this rising tide of this antichristal spirit and us going on offense. The gates of hell will not prevail against that church. God is giving us the power. He has given even to Peter way back when, the powers to bind and to loose, to permit or to release. And so, as, as Jerry Boykin was talking earlier, one of the things that was highlighted to me as he was speaking was the power of his prayer in the midst of tremendous conflict where his own life and the lives of those that he cared about were in jeopardy. What Jerry did not know is that one of the principal things that I drew out of the D-Day-like invasion is we controlled the air. We controlled the air. It is said in... Some of the, the, the information I've gotten is about the D-Day invasion was by a book, from, a book by Stephen Ambrose. Perhaps you've read it or heard about it. I, I will tell you the significance of the, of the air war to me. When particularly prayer seems to be uh, taking a shot these days is that individuals like Rees Howes controlled battles that were very instrumental in the success of what they were praying for and God giving them information. I will tell you this, if there's a thing that all of us can participate in in an active way, is this ongoing mobilization of prayer that God is asking for us in this hour. One of the things that I'm well aware of when we do national and international stuff, even for meetings that are done here, is that they have a a much higher level of success if the prayer warriors that are behind the scenes have well-oiled the skids and have broken the ground and have taken the ground that's needed to be taken prior to these meetings. And boy, if we're going to be invading nations and resisting this rising tide of this antichrist spirit that is proliferating all throughout the nations, God is asking us in this hour to mobilize in the, in the strongest sense the power of our prayer and our prayer life. I have all kinds of illustrations on this PowerPoint of, of how the prayer... Uh, of of Rees House College, get this, it's a smaller group of people. 
It's not necessarily even an international group or groups that were related from one city to another. It was God speaking to them about the crucial things that he wanted to do to save different nations or cities. And the power of their prayer, it seems like even with the invasion of Germany into Russia, it seemed like Moscow was about ready to be overthrown and it seemed inevitable But God laid it on the heart of that group of people to pray into existence something that did not exist. And that was the power to change what would happen with armies that would be seeking to invade that city. And the power of their prayer turned everything around. Time after time after time after time. So one of the things that we need to do in this hour is to mobilize a prayer initiative throughout the nations. And I I believe that Jerry Boykin set this thing up when he's talking about individuals that are on on the doorstep of death and God changing the outcome because Jerry is offering a prayer from the from the heart of a, re- of a righteous man, and God changes that outcome. So the very thing that we can do, and I, I will tell you this, and I just have a few minutes left, but I will tell you this, is one of the things that I have been touching on here uh, when I have spoken to our local church here is God is looking for superstars. God's looking for people. The illustration that I gave when I was talking about this, this uh, God looking for superstars is a man named Dan Gable. I, I was an Olympian. I played in the 1972 Olympics. And the guy that was the hero of all of, of, all of our Olympians was this guy named Dan Gable because he set his heart and his training routines to be so significant that he rose above everybody else. I do believe that God's looking for individuals that will tailor their lives somewhat like Paul did. When Paul said, these guys do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we're doing it to get an incorruptible crown. Therefore, I beat my body under and I bring it into subjection. God's looking for us. He's looking for individuals that will be fully dedicated to the corporate vision of the hour that will connect and align themselves to see the latter house be greater than that of the former house. God's issuing invitations for us in this hour and God's waiting He's looking to see what we're going to do with the invitation of the hour that we're in. There's many other things that I could say about all of this. I think I recall some kind of wording like that in one of Paul's epistles. But I will tell you this. I think the point is being made. God wants us to mobilize. God wants us to respond to the shifting powers of this antichristal spirit that is seeking to invade and control and manipulate and destroy the, the nation of Israel, God's wanting us to mobilize. And in the secret of your own prayer closet and in the secret of your own personal disciplines, I do believe that we can distinguish ourselves as the superheroes of this hour, I want to tell you this. God never discouraged greatness in his kingdom. He only said, this is how you get there. Be a servant. Be one that's a slave to the purposes of God. And I do believe that we can distinguish ourselves in this hour to respond to what the invitation is. My wife has a couple of announcements uh, concerning some of the things that we're going to be doing. I'm going to put up uh, sometime throughout the conference some ways that you can be involved here at Morningstar. 
I do believe that we're responding. There's many things that Morningstar's doing to respond to this, like a school of the prophets. School of the prophets. If you want to get a train, if you want to get trained and equipped, the school of the prophets. If you're a student and you want to become involved in Morning Stars University, that's available. Our MFM network is also available to people. Right now, and I will tell you, we have a significant increase. Just this year alone, we have 120 applicants, which represents about 100, 150 people because husband and wife supply. There's something that is being released to train God's people for this hour. I have a course out called According to the Pattern, and it has to do with character traits that God wants you to be involved with, that he's looking for for his leaders to display. When we begin to tailor our lives and order our lives in the fashion that God wants us to order them in, significant things can happen. If you're looking to be involved with connect groups, we have connect groups here. There's a brochure out there. There's also online connect groups that we're doing. And I'm not particularly advertising what we're doing. We're just a small segment of what God's doing throughout the world. But I do believe that you've come here to hear a preceding word, a word from the Lord concerning what's happening. I do believe that God is looking for a D-Day-like invasion into the nations of the earth. He wants the prophetic spirit released in these nations. He wants prayer initiatives unlike we have ever seen before. He wants all of those things to begin to coalesce around the word of the Lord that I do believe you're gonna hear released throughout the time that we have together. I pray for God's richest blessing upon all of you, just like I do for my own kids and my own grandkids. But let us not get so consumed with that that we ignore the greater call. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. God's looking for us to be the superheroes of the hour. Amen. Amen.